welcome home my family, my brothers, my sisters, not just my blood, we are all one giant body, one big family. So welcome home, aho mataki oisen, jai baguan, namaste, haush haush, assalamu alaikum, Pax <laughs> Moviksum. I'm not sure if I said that last one correctly. I have a very special book I'm interested in diving into today. So I've turned off the heater. I'm going to be reading from this book to you. I've concluded it would be appropriate to share with you the first opening of this. And if it is um, sucking you in and pulling you, I will encourage you to pick up this book and to finish where we are going to be leaving off today. And if you need to step away and pause and continue reading this another time or continue listening at another time, or if you need to re-listen, please trust your natural instincts, okay? So do what you love, the money will follow. I'm going to be honest with you that when I'm reading a book, I am a front to back reader. However, I'm not going to read the personal acknowledgments. However, what I will read to you is the introduction and then the first two chapters. So let us begin. About 10 years ago, I began to experience a great longing to change my life. The thought of letting go of what I had, a well-paying, secure job, a beautiful home, friends and family nearby, was truly terrifying. I, who had always clung to the outward forms of security, I, who had wanted guarantees in every part of my life, also ignored the inner dissatisfactions and urgings I felt. Years before this prompting from within had started, and I had ignored it, I distracted myself with a respected career and with the inevitable promotions that came my way. I distracted myself even more successfully with an accumulation of material rewards and symbols of success, the unknown was far too frightening to me. This despite the fact that by all outward appearances, I was a creative, spontaneous, and enthusiastic person. In reality, I did not truly trust myself. I was afraid to cross uncharted, unconventional waters to get to a more desirable place in life. Afraid that, when truth be told, I would not have the requisite strength and competence to accomplish what I so dearly wanted. I could not even imagine how to start. While I did believe the adage, what man can conceive, he can achieve. I couldn't conceive of doing what I knew I would love. My mind clung so desperately to the familiar. Then one day, as I drove to work along beautiful Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles on a smogless, sunny California morning, a startling thought entered my head. It was as clear a thought as if someone was speaking to me. Do what you love. The money will follow. At that very moment, I knew I had to and would take a leap of faith. I knew I had to and would step out, cut myself loose from all those things that seemed to bind me. I knew I would start doing what I most enjoyed, writing, working with industry instead of public education, and living in the country instead of in the city. That decision transformed my life. Since that day, I have gradually expanded my role as an educator and as an organizational psychologist. I have added a depth and complexity 
to my work, which I had always hoped I could have, a dimension my intellect thirst for, but which self-doubt made me believe could not be mine. Paradoxically, I have also simplified my life. I have relocated to a quiet, rural community where I had wanted to live. I am working on projects and with people that hold keen creative interests for me. All my material needs are met. I did what I loved and the money did follow. But in this regard, I am not unique. Countless others have discovered the validity of the do what you love premise. Over the years, I have met hundreds of people whose example and experience serve as added proof and inspiration that it is possible to do work that is intrinsically fulfilling and also be able to pay the bills. Do what you love, the money will follow, is my acknowledgement to all people who do the work they really enjoy. It is also a handbook that hopefully will show readers how to follow their own hearts to the work of their dreams. And more, it is at its core a comment about the spiritual aspects of work. A book that suggests people can fulfill themselves as authentic, unique human beings through doing their right livelihoods. This book says that work, love, play, and ultimately even devotion are unified into a cohesive activity for the fully developed, self-actualizing personality. This final larger dimension of the book stretches the psychology of work beyond mundane understandings of vocational theory into a developmental commentary about work. Work can be used as can anything and everything we do to communicate our love for self and other. For the rare person who is religiously or spiritually inclined, work even becomes a vehicle for devotion a way of utilizing one's gifts and talents to serve others, a way of truthful self-expression. I suppose this deeper message categorizes do what you love as a text in spiritual psychology, but I believe anyone can utilize the principles outlined herein for his or her own growth and development. A word more about my background may be in order. A few years ago, as I began to say in the opening paragraphs, I was a public school teacher. For five or six years, I taught all levels of students, primary, middle, and even college level classes. Then for another five years, I served as a public school principal. This soon became a demonstration school for the county in progressive educational programs. For another two years, I was a curriculum consultant and a mediator slash liaison agent for public school districts and the State Board of Education. I mentioned my educator's background so that readers can get a sense of the tradition and professional ethic of my own vocation. These early professional years were spent working for a public school district in California and simultaneously for six years, teaching and designing management development programs for Loyola University's Industrial Relations Center in Los Angeles. At no time until my relationship with Loyola University did I have any business training. Despite this apparent lack in business background, I have been unusually successful in the private sector. Today, I had my own small, vigorously healthy private practice in organizational psychology, mediation, and corporate change management. The problems I solve are in the management slash leadership domain. I am privileged to work with and advise some of America's top corporate executives. These men and women are among the brightest, most ethical and creative people in the country, even though prior to starting my own firm, I had no previous industrial experience, no business connections, no right to imagine that I had something to offer Harvard, Stanford, and Yale graduates. To name a 
but a few of the superior universities from which my clients have graduated growing into this advisory role has been as natural for me as breathing. Perhaps I dared imagine having something to offer industry's leadership because I felt uniquely qualified for my work. My qualifications are not born of schooling, degrees, or of the right political or business connections, but of natural, intuitional talent. It was this talent which I believe urged me to leave the familiar. And this sort of talent which most people can locate within themselves. Advanced training and experience are important, of course, but we should not put the cart before the horse. My own experience in adjusting my professional course in midstream to that of a more expanded, sophisticated, and complex one, and the experience of hundreds of my own clients and in interview subjects who have successfully revised their careers provides the foundation for the guidance I offer in Do What You Love. This book presents our stories, stories I have been gathering with increasing momentum over the last decade. It also presents a good deal of solid psychological background material about what is required to know and do one's right livelihood. Additionally, the benefits of such work are detailed at length. Readers will be able to reflect upon their own situations and apply the principles of right livelihood to their own lives. They will recognize case illustrations of people like themselves. They will identify with people who are worried about paying bills or pleasing parents, spouses, or other authority figures. Or with those who felt they were too old, too inexperienced, or too undeserving to identify and do fulfilling work. The case examples I use are not of persons who, by some magical fluke of fate, just close their eyes to the necessities and demands of the real world. These are not people who woke up one day to find themselves rolling into a fun job and money. I am not suggesting that such outcomes are likely or even most desirable. Nor am I suggesting in any way that doing what one loves means doing what one feels like doing. In some cases, people who are embarking upon finding and doing work they loved are still waiting for the money to follow. This is the case of one of my oldest friends who years ago decided to become an actress. She is still hard at work studying, working at bit parts and off-Broadway roles to make that dream a reality. Thus, I maintain that hard, patient, disciplined, long-term effort is required to do one's right livelihood. Others I know are still in school, in some cases an investment in tedious, often boring graduate or advanced studies may be necessary. Others hold down two jobs, as in the case of a woman I know who wants to be an artist but who is not good enough yet to profitably sell her work. First, she must paint, experiment, paint more, learn what works for her. This period will, for her, take years. Consequently, she works at another job full time while she spends all weekend time, almost every evening painting. I write of this so that at the outset, no one thinks I am suggesting that material rewards immediately flow out of the leap of faith, which is made to do one's right livelihood. The reason that this book's title contains the phrase, the money will follow, is precisely because we must do the work first. Invest of ourselves first, seed faithfully in the small, steady, incremental ways of our chosen work. First, and then, as a harvest of abundant crops naturally follows, the seeding, watering, and constant caring process of seeds, the fruits of our efforts result. While the people I describe in these pages are working away at their chosen vocations, simultaneously, they are growing successfully as human beings. 
And this is the beauty of right livelihood. As people honor the actions they value most by doing them, they become more authentic, more reliable, more self-disciplined. They grow to trust themselves more. They learn to listen to their own inner voice as a steady, truthful, and strengthening guide for what to do next and even how to do it. The example of such individuals points the way for like-minded others to plan their growth steps as that growth specifically relates to their own life's work. The examples I have used throughout this book are realistic. Sometimes they only teach us how to be patient and endure. At other times, because of a specific success or enthusiasm expressed, the examples serve to inspire. The following pages contain stories and a continual psychological narrative about what it takes to build inner confidence and self-esteem and about how to listen to one's own self and hear one's own inner voice over the din and the clatter of experts, society's expectations, and media hype. It is this inner listening that is necessary if one wants to follow the way of the heart to the work that is most enjoyable, most fulfilling. Readers will survey that the right livelihood is excuse me, we'll survey what the right livelihood is and how it leads people to personal health and personal development. They will examine what I call the big R, resistance, in order to see how this phenomenon blocks energy and enthusiasm, robs them of satisfaction and reward. They will explore the subject of money and see how it relates to feelings of high self-worth, feelings which are so necessary to making life what we want it to be, as well as necessary to earning a decent salary or fee for our efforts. Readers will come to understand how increased self-trust and high self-esteem leads to increased material success and, at the very least, to self-respect. They will read that high self-esteem only comes from confronting and handling life's challenges not from taking an easy, contracted life position. Additionally, readers will learn how to maximize their own resources while waiting for the money to follow. They will discover how to prepare for the unknown and unexpected, how to enjoy whatever it is they must do until their goals are realized. Hopefully, they will realize that doing what they love provides rich inner rewards that include money but which also transcend money. Finally, perhaps most importantly, do what you love reveals a well-kept secret that there are hundreds of thousands of people who have become, excuse me, who have overcome both internal and external obstacles to become successful doing work that they love. If people can cultivate self-respect and inner security, and develop a commitment to their own talents. They can earn as much money as they need or want. This is true success. And this book describes what it takes to achieve it and even what it means to go beyond the goal of money to the goal of authentic self-expression, self-trust, and actualization. The task is easier than people imagine. All it takes is everything they have to give. All their talent, energy, focus, commitment, and all their love. The rewards are worth it and are evident the minute one consciously chooses on behalf of his or her own values, inclinations, and visions. Chapter 1, The Psychology of Right Livelihood. It opens up with a quote. It says, I'm looking for something more than money out of my work. I expect deep fulfillment and a little fun too. Executive major U.S. Corporation. Work I disliked the most was work I wasn't suited for. 
Once, for example, I sold vacuum cleaners door to door. Now there's nothing wrong with that job except I was painfully shy and basically introverted and knocking on doors in strange neighborhoods was for me an unnatural act. But I was working my way through college and in desperate need of tuition money. So I silenced my fears and told myself I could do it. The money was good and that somehow made it all right. The only catch was my heart wasn't in it. I lasted one day. Looking back on that experience and others depressingly like it, I realized that I am not cut out for some occupations. I have a specific disposition and a given set of aptitudes that require an equally specific type of work. I know now that work needs to fit my personality, just as shoes need to fit my feet. Otherwise, I'm destined for discomfort. As an organizational psychologist and educator, I have come to believe that this is true for everyone. Our right work is just as important to personality, health, and growth as the right nutrients are for our bodies. Almost any job has its benefits. At least I don't have to take it home with me. It's only five minutes away. It pays the bills are some of the advantages people identify in their otherwise uninteresting, tedious, or unrewarding work. Moreover, even in situations not particularly suited to them, people are able to develop new abilities. A shy person can learn to be more socially comfortable by selling vacuum cleaners, cars, or Tupperware. An extrovert can learn to work in solitary, focused settings. A technical specialist can become a good manager of people. Clearly, we can see that people do grow through staying the course, through facing difficulty, through self-discipline, through toughening their resolve and perseverance. Yet, even though we are all fairly adaptable, elastic, and multidimensional, we are not born to struggle through life. We are meant to work in ways that suit us, drawing on our natural talents and abilities as a way to express ourselves and contribute to others. This work, when we find it and do it, even if only as a hobby at first, is a key to our true happiness and self-expression. Most of us think about our jobs or our careers as a means to fulfill responsibilities to families and creditors, to gain more material comforts and to achieve status and recognition. But we pay a high price for this kind of thinking. A large percentage of America's working population do not enjoy the work they do. This is a profoundly tragic statistic considering that work consumes so much time in our lives. In a few brief decades, our working life adds up to be life itself. Such a nose to the grindstone attitude is not even a good formula for success. When you study people who are successful, as I have over the years, it is abundantly clear that their achievements are directly related to the enjoyment they derive from their work. They enjoy it in large part because they are good at it. A bright client of mine once told me, I am at my best when I'm using my brain. My ideal day is when my boss gives me lots of complex problems to solve. Another client remarked, I like people and when I'm involved with them, time just flies by. Since I've been in sales, I find everyone I meet interesting and fun to talk to. I should be paying my company for letting me do this work. Right livelihood is an idea about work, which is linked to the natural order of things. It is doing our best at what we do best. The rewards that follow are inevitable and manifold. There is no way we can fail. Biology points out the logic of right livelihood. Every species in the natural world has a place and a function that is specifically suited to its capabilities. This is true for people too. Some of us are uniquely equipped for physical work, athletics, or dance. Some of us have special intellectual gifts that make possible 
abstract or inventive thinking. Some of us have aesthetic abilities and eye-hand coordination that enables us to paint, sculpt, or design. Examples are numerous of nature's way of directing us to the path that will support us economically and emotionally. This is the path that we are meant to travel. Any talent that we are born with eventually surfaces as a need. Current research on child prodigies, youngsters, who from an early age are mathematical wizards, virtuoso musicians, brilliant performers, tells us that they possess a burning desire to express themselves, to use their unique gifts. In a similar fashion, each of us, no matter how ordinary we consider our talents, wants and needs to use them. Right livelihood is the natural expression of this need. Yet many of us cannot imagine that what we enjoy doing, what we have a talent for, could be a source of income for us, or even a catalyst for transforming our relationship to work. But indeed, it can be. Leaders in every walk of life, housewives, craft persons, entrepreneurs, inventors, community volunteers, etc., who have the drive, skill, and compelling vision to advance their ideas despite obstacles, need to exert their influence as much as their solutions, energy, and enthusiasm are needed by others. The original concept of right livelihood apparently comes from the teachings of Buddha, who describes it as work consciously chosen. Done with full awareness and care, leading to enlightenment. I do not advocate saffron robes and vows of poverty, but I am keenly aware of the wisdom contained in the Buddha's concept. For many people today, alienated from their talents and labors, his injunction is food for considerable thought. We must begin to think about ourselves and our work in a larger sense than mere nine to five penance for our daily bread. However, this larger concept of work carries with its increased demands, demands not everyone is willing to meet. Right livelihood in both its ancient and its contemporary sense embodies self-expression, commitment, mindfulness, conscious choice and conscious choice. Finding and doing work of this sort is predicted upon high self-esteem and self-trust. Since only those who like themselves, who subjectively feel they are trustworthy and deserving, dare to choose on behalf of what is right and true for them. When the powerful quality of conscious choice is present in our work, we can enormously, excuse me, I'm going to read the sentence again. When the powerful quality of conscious choice is present in our work, we can be enormously productive. When we consciously choose to do work we enjoy, not only can we get things done, we can get them done well and be intrinsically rewarded for our efforts. Money and security cease to be our only payments. Let me discuss each of these qualities to illustrate my point. Conscious choice. The very best way to relate to our work is to choose it. Right livelihood is predicated upon conscious choice. Unfortunately, since we learn early to act on what others say, value, and expect, we often find ourselves a long way down the wrong road before realizing we did not actually choose our work. Turning our lives around is usually the beginning of maturity since it means correcting choices made unconsciously without deliberation or thought. The ability to choose our work is no small matter. It takes courage to act on what we value and to willingly accept the consequences of our choices. Being able to choose means not allowing fear to inhibit or control us, even though our choices may require us to act against our fears or against the wishes of those we love and admire. Choosing sometimes forces us to leave secure and familiar arrangements. Because I work with so many people who are poised 
on the brink of such choices, I have come to respect the courage it takes to even examine work and life options honestly. Many pay lip service to this process. And to do something about the truths we discover in life is no easy matter. However, more people live honest lives than we might imagine. One young woman told me she had grown unusually depressed about her career in finance, one for which she had been preparing herself since high school. Lately, I've lost interest in what I'm doing. I'm living more for the weekends. On Sunday nights, I find myself dreading Monday mornings. Maybe I'm bored and need more responsibility. Yet when her boss suggested she return to graduate school for an MBA, she began to feel even worse. What she found in herself was a host of conflicting desires. After scrutinizing her enjoyments, motivations, and values, she admitted, When I first started talking with you, I thought I wanted to climb the corporate ladder. But I've come to realize that the idea of starting back to graduate school doesn't appeal to me at all. This is the first time I've been willing to see that. I realize I haven't been truthful with myself. What I really want is more flexibility with my time, not less. I dearly want to have children and to be a mother. I've entertained the graduate school goal as to please other people. My boss, even my parents would like to see me become a financial whiz. I know I have the capacity to be good in finance, and I guess I look like their image of the corporate brain who makes good. But I also know I have great interest in raising a family, in being a good wife and mother, in trying my hand at some sort of crafts. This is what would really be satisfying to me at this time, not business. She discussed her decision with her parents and with her boss, and they were highly critical. But she was willing to pay the price of their possible rejection in order to stick to her choice. I feel more together than I have in a long time, she told me later. I feel an inner confidence that tells me things will work out just fine. A Spanish proverb teaches, God says, choose what you will and pay for it. And so it is that as we weigh the yes slash no possibilities of our choices, we learn more about our strengths and weaknesses and become more willing and able to pay the price of each choice. By choosing, we learn to be responsible. By paying the price of choices, we learn to make better choices. Each choice we make consciously adds positively to our sense of ourselves and makes us trust ourselves more because we learn how to live up to our own inner standards and goals. But the reverse is also true. When we unconsciously drift through life, we cultivate self-doubt, apathy, passivity, and poor judgment. By struggling, by facing the difficulties of making Conscious choices, we grow stronger, more capable, and more responsible to ourselves. Once we see and accept that our talents are also our blueprint for satisfying vocational life, then we can stop looking to others for approval and direction. Choosing consciously also forces us to stop postponing a commitment. And this way we move one step closer to being responsible contributing adults. Choosing our work allows us to enter into that work willingly, enthusiastically, and mindfully. Whatever our work is, whether we love it or not, we can choose to do it well, to be with it moment to moment, to combat the temptation to back away from being fully present. As we practice this art and attitude, we also grow more capable of enjoying work itself. Work as a way of being. As a way of working and as a way of thinking about work, right livelihood embodies its own psychology, a psychology of a person moving toward the fullest participation in life, a person growing in self-awareness, trust, and high self-esteem. Abraham Maslow, foremost to study and describe such healthy personalities, calls them self-actualizing. The phrase simply means growing whole. 
These are people who have taken the moment to moment risks to ensure that their entire lives become an outward expression of their true inner selves. They have a sense of their own worth and are likely to experiment, to be creative, to ask for what they want and need. Their high self-esteem and subsequent risk-taking slash creativity brings them a host of competencies that are indispensable to locating work they want. They also develop the tenacity and optimism which allows them to stick with their choices until financial rewards come. They are life affirming. For them, work is the way of being an expression of love. A friend of mine is a furniture maker, a true craftsman and artist. Of his work, he says, I get great satisfaction from making fine furniture. The process enriches me, makes me feel that I am somehow in each piece. He believes, as I do, that part of the unique beauty of a lovely handmade piece comes from its being part of the spirit that has brought to it during its making. He nourishes his creations with his care and attention and his work in turn nourishes him. Self-actualizing persons follow the often slow and difficult path of self-discipline, perseverance, and integrity. No less is required of those who yearn to trade in our jobs or careers for our right livelihoods work that suits our temperaments and capabilities, work that we love, self-expression. Work is a natural vehicle for self-expression because we spend most of our time in its thrall. It simply makes no sense to turn off our personality, squelch our real abilities, forget our need for stimulation and personal growth 40 hours out of every week. Work can be a means of allowing the varied and complex aspects of our personality to act on our behalf, translating our attitudes, feelings, and perceptions into meaningful productivity. It may help to think of yourself as an artist whose work is obviously a form of self-expression. His first efforts may appear to be experimental, scattered, bland, or indistinct. But as he applies and disciplines himself, as he hones his skills and comes to know himself, his paintings become a signature of the inner man. In time, each canvas speaks of the artist's worldview, his conscious and subconscious images, and his values. He can be understood through his works almost as if he had written an autobiography. Through the medium, Excuse me, though the medium may be different, physicians, carpenters, salespersons, bicycle repairman, anyone who uses his work as a means of self expression will gain the satisfaction of growth and self understanding and will single himself out of the crowd. Even entrepreneurs who compromise a large part of my client base tell me that there is something within which finds outer expression through their business. This expression allows their ventures to thrive. The remarkable thing about such self-expression, they say, is that it breeds confidence, both in themselves and in the customers and employees who quickly recognize someone whom they can count on. Commitment. When we are pursuing our right livelihood, even the most difficult and demanding aspects of our work will not sway us from our course. When others say, don't work so hard, or don't you ever take a break? We will respond in bewilderment. What others may see as duty, pressure, or tedium, we perceive as a kind of pleasure. Commitment is easy when our work is our right livelihood. As social activist and former Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, John Gardner once said, the best kept secret is that people want to work hard on behalf of something they feel is meaningful, something they believe in. I met with a young man last year who had drifted into a far from satisfying but lucrative computer career. After much inner struggle, he decided to leave his secure niche to return to school and study psychology. 
Recently, I received a letter from him and a copy of a straight A transcript of his first semester courses. He was elated about his grades, but he was having a hard time making ends meet, a condition he had never before encountered. Yet his certainty that he had found the right path for his life allowed him to excel and also gave him the power to respond resourcefully to the trials his new choice presented. He used his former skills and contacts to find part-time work and eventually decided to take a semester off to earn the lion's share of his tuition. Once upon a time, I would have quit when the going got rough, he reflected. But now I'm eager to do what I must to stick to my choice because he is committed to his choice. He has gained a new level of vitality, which fuels his ability to see it through to completion. Successful people not only have goals, they have goals that are meaningful for them. They know where they are going and they enjoy the trek. Some, excuse me, like this man, when we are excited about what we are doing, when we are progressively moving towards the realization of meaningful goals, the difficulties become solvable problems, not insurmountable obstacles. I know that nothing will stop him from becoming a psychologist, and he will probably be a fine one at that. I knew it when he wrote in his letter, the courses have been difficult and challenging, but I feel at home in this work and I'm experiencing great joy for the first time in my life. Mindfulness. If we think of what we do every day as only a job or even as only a career, we may fail to use it fully for our own development and enrichment. When we are bored, frustrated, constrained, or dulled by what we do all day, we don't take advantage of the opportunities it offers. Moreover, we don't even see opportunities, the kind of relationship to work that is manifested in drifting attention, clock watching, and wishing to be elsewhere also robs us of energy and satisfaction. In contrast, anyone who has experienced active, concentrated attention knows the truth of the statement by well-known Quaker writer Douglas Steer, work without contemplation is never enough. You may have played a game of bridge, read a book, gardened, pieced together a ship in a bottle. Afterward, you realize that you had lost track of the passage of time and forgotten your cares. A friend's experience of a tennis game illustrates the power inherent in mindfulness during work. It was a slow motion game. Everything lost its ordinary quality. Everything seemed more vivid. I could almost see the threads on the tennis ball. That's how fully I was in the moment. I was entirely free of caring whether I won or lost. I played without my usual ego and emotion. I just played with total attention and my game was unsurpassed. More than that, I felt completely happy and fulfilled. What can be achieved in such a monetary pursuit is the result of a quality of mind, a mind fully absorbed in its task in the present that can be available to us daily when we are working at our right livelihood. Absorption is the key to mindfulness, the deep involvement in the work itself and in the way which each task is performed. Mindfulness puts us in a constant present, releasing us from the clatter of distracting thoughts so that our energy, creativity, and productivity are undiluted. You become your most effective. Attention is power. And those who work in a state of mindful awareness bring an almost supernatural power to what they do. If you are asking, how can I do what I love when I'm afraid when I'm uncertain of the outcome, when I have to make ends meet, when I don't even know what I love to do, read on. You too can find your right livelihood. And when you do, it will enable you to pay the bills and will richly reward you with a sense of meaningful participation in one's life you have. <sighs> I'm going to mention a little footnote and then I'll go on to the next chapter. This footnote says, right livelihood was properly addressed in the mid 70s in 
Seven Laws of Money, co-authored by Michael Phillips and others. Professor Theodore Rozak's book, Person Slash Planet, contains an entire chapter on right livelihood and chopped wood slash carry water also discusses it. Shun Ru Suzuki, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind has a profound effect on my vocational life. Further information on these books may be found in the reference section in the back of this book. Chapter two, the belief system called myself. This chapter also opens with a quote. It says, it's too late. I've spent too many years doing exactly what was expected of me, being a good son, a good husband, a good father. In my company, I'm known as a good soldier. When I ask myself what I am about, I'd have to say I don't know anymore. I've tried for so long to fit in. I've held back for so long. I don't know what or who I am. Middle-aged executive, multinational corporation. High self-esteem provides the power to know what and who we are. It gives us the courage to live out that very personal knowledge in our daily actions, choices, and way of interacting with the world. Conversely, low self-esteem cripples the ability to make waves on behalf of what we know is right and truthful for ourselves. In extreme cases, it hides what the individual wants. In striving to achieve emotional security, acceptance, and a sense of belonging, people who don't think well of themselves violate their own life and its directives in favor of the wishes and expectations of others. People with high self-esteem have many advantages when it comes to choosing their right livelihoods. Thus, as a first step in our discussion of this topic, it is helpful to examine the critically important skills and characteristics that such individuals share. They know what they want because they hear themselves and are able to pay attention to the silent, indwelling push to pursue one career or life path over another. In this way, they acknowledge their unique life's purpose. They have a sense or feeling that they deserve to have a life, including work, that makes them happy. They feel deserving because they have experienced themselves as being in their own corner rather than abandoning what they know is right and fulfilling. They are not weighed down with heavy, extraneous baggage of fear, guilt, and nameless self-defeating thought patterns. They solve problems creatively and assertively, acting from a consistent base of self-trust. Their self-statements tell them, that they have what it takes to figure out what to do. They have learned that they must respond to trouble. And so they faced squarely whatever challenges they meet. They are self-disciplined and willing to take time to get what they want. Not compulsively motivated to have everything instantly. People with high self-esteem are willing to pay the cost of being in charge of their own lives. This means they behave in consistently disciplined, patient, concentrated ways as opposed to hoping that someone will do the difficult chores for them or rescue them from the tedious, demanding task at hand. This characteristic further bolsters their self-esteem. By contrast, those with low self-esteem do not know what they want out of life. They have lived protected, restricted, perhaps indulged or abused lives so much that their day-to-day -day behaviors are constricted, fear-motivated, and timid. The person with a healthy self-view knows how to fend for himself in work as well as in other areas of life. He places great reliance upon himself in determining the course of his life and in deciding how to act. Active, creative, and enterprising, this individual initiates more activities directly related to his own life's goals than does the person with low self-esteem. As a result, his subjective level of comfort and satisfaction is higher too. A young man who fits all the characteristics I have described wrote me a letter in connection with this study.
In it, he described how he found a work that was perfect for him. Even though his parents and friends expect him to enter another field, he writes, I am a full-time college student working part-time, but my job has basically changed the course of my life. I am a student assistant teacher substitute at my university's campus child care center. I am on call Monday through Friday, and I have been assigned to all age groups, but mostly I work with the infant slash toddler group. The main responsibility of the job is to make sure that all the children are taken care of. This includes their supervision, feeding, and even diaper changing. I also have additional supervisory responsibilities. My feelings for this job are difficult for me to put them into words, but here is a try. First of all, in case you haven't guessed from my handwriting, I am a male. This has made for some interesting situations. My own reactions to the job were mixed at first because I have never been around children of this age and I wasn't sure whether I would be able to handle, excuse me, wouldn't be able to, yeah. I wasn't sure whether I would be able to get the hang of all that maternal stuff. After my first few days, however, I was adapting so well and having such a great time. I couldn't imagine why I'd been apprehensive. I couldn't imagine why I'd been apprehensive. I find that when I'm working, I become so totally involved that I forget everything else. That has never happened with any other job I've had. I also find that I have unlimited energy while I'm working, but as soon as I get home, I discover that I'm exhausted. I feel that if I weren't getting paid, I'd rather be with the kids than doing anything else. As I mentioned, this job has helped change my life. I was rather frustrated, unhappy computer science major for a little over a year. At the beginning of the school year, I knew I had to change, but I had no idea to what. In high school, people didn't ask me what I was going to major in. They asked me where I was going to major in computer science. Working with children had never been an option for me. But after discovering that I was good with children, and more importantly, that I loved working with them, I was able to plan out with a career counselor a basic set of goals, the main one being to graduate with a degree in child development. This is a typical example of how people who believe in themselves listen to themselves about things that count. It also shows how work can liberate energies, emotions, and a developmental life path when one is rightly situated. And it illustrates another related characteristic of the mature personality, a maturity discussed more in depth in the third part of this book, which has little to do with chronological age, and that is the tendency to experience work as play. I cannot imagine doing this. I'd pay them to let me do this. I get so engrossed, I don't know where the time goes. These are all attitudes of people who have resolved the work slash play split. For them, there is no difference between their life's work and a recreational pursuit. In part, this attitude stems from their keen involvement with their work. They also feel this way since their attention is not divided between thoughts of what they are doing and what they would rather be doing. Unlike the bumper sticker, I'd rather be sailing, which some people put on their cars, these individuals would not rather be doing anything else. How can it be that some people have so many real and subjective advantages? The answer is found partially in the idea of self. Their verdict about their likability their competence, their powerfulness, or ability to handle life. In other words, the answer rests in their self-esteem. People who like themselves allow themselves to succeed in all aspects of life, even in their work. Self-esteem is, of course, not a static thing, nor a black or white concrete issue. It fluctuates and adapts to whatever we happen to be doing or feeling at a given time. On some days and in some situations, we are more confident that we can do what we intend. Sound health, a good night's sleep, familiar surroundings, and supportive people all help us feel strong and capable. On other days, for example, after a rough day work or after confrontive meeting, we may feel spent, fatigued, perhaps even fearful. 
As coach Vince Lombardi said, fatigue makes cowards of all of us. From everyday life experiences, we perhaps know what it means to feel cowardly inside. We probably know how it feels to be courageous and strong too. The point, however, is that when we talk of self-esteem, we are really discussing a person's dominant way of being. His life's posture, his overall tendency with respect to the important issues of personal power, competence, and worthwhileness. These clusters of attitudes color everything he does, how he relates to others, whether he feels he has the option to speak up for what is of value to him, despite fears, rejection, criticism, etc., whether he believes he deserves to live in a fulfilling, personally meaningful way, because feelings fluctuate and because we often choose to ignore and act against our feelings, I am not discussing self-esteem as a feeling. Rather, it is a total belief system that predictably sets up choices and experiences for us and thus continually reinforces itself through our habitual ways of acting. It is our total way of experiencing life, the context or filter through which perceptions are screened. In other words, it is a major belief system that helps shape our reality. While it is not my purpose in this book to discuss the nature of reality, a few words may be in order about how we set our reality, especially since this mindset follows us throughout life if we do nothing consciously to alter it. The tone, plot, and outcomes of our life flow out of this original belief we have about our personal worth, capability, and power. Self-esteem is our earliest self-verdict. It can also be described as a self-judgment. It is our primary idea about that abstraction we call myself. Formed early in life, perhaps even before birth, our self-judgment becomes our worldview shaper, the mold, or the context from which other perceptions flow. At birth, we either connect to or may somehow be rejected by our mother, a mother whose body, touch, and verbal slash nonverbal cues become our matrix or primary connection with the world. Ultimately, this matrix, our idea about ourselves in relationship to it, becomes our sense of the world. Added to the shaping influence of this original subjective impression are other cues that we get from significant adults, any adult to whom we repeatedly turn for security, praise, nourishment, guidance, and love. We take in the obvious and not so obvious messages that adults in our midst give us, their verbal and silent communications, their domination or passivity, their fair and respectful treatment or abuse, we examine the way in which they encourage us to live forceful, self-affirming lives or the way in which they thwart us towards self-abandonment in order to please or protect them. Do they show us respect? Are they fair or unjust? Do they listen to us when we tell them our needs? How do they act when we ask for what we want? Do they help us solve our problems or do they rush in and solve them for us? Do they avoid us, abandon us? Do they die? Are they predictable? Do they enter into a deep, trustworthy relationship with us? How we interpret these messages and perhaps the messages themselves quickly form the stuff of our self-opinion. Everything these cues convey help us create our conception of self, world, and other people. Solidly, consistently, and forever, our beliefs are shaped unless we consciously decide to reinterpret matters in later years. Ultimately, everything experienced is screened through the filter of our self-view. We screen out evidence that contradicts our initial self-opinion. 
and selectively take in evidence that supports it. Our thoughts, choices, and attitudes form a relationship with things, others, and events. This tapestry weaves in and out of all impressions, experiences, feedback, and injunctions, turning out to be the fabric of our very self. What we think we are evolves into what we in fact become. Thus, our infant minds are structured both from within ourselves and from without. To understand how deeply our belief system affects our life and how it develops, it may be helpful to examine three key questions that we answer in early childhood. These involve our sense of power, our sense of competence, and our sense of worthwhileness. Number one, the power question. As human beings, we must know whether or not we can handle life's difficulties. While still young, we look for evidence that we can survive by our own resources. Children who learn to deal with and cope with difficult situations feel that they have the wherewithal to tackle life. Those who have not had the opportunity to see what they can do usually lack information about their own power. In extreme cases, they grow up believing they are helpless. Helplessness and powerfulness are both learned. Children who survive a rough childhood, for example, often become exemplary adults. Research about such youngsters indicates that about 15% of those who make it through the most taxing, abusive, or fearful childhoods become highly able, competent adults. In successfully surmounting the trials of their youth, they develop a powerful, resourceful self-image. It's easy to imagine why they also inspire others and why others like to be around them. They believe they are able because they have seen themselves able in real life situations. A friend, a successful businesswoman whom I interviewed about this topic, talked about her childhood and her ability to get out of a small, poverty-stricken southern town. I don't really know what gave me the initial idea that I can make it out of that horrible situation. I had no education, no advantages of any kind, but I recall that as one of nine children, I was able to get the attention I needed. As bad as things got, I always knew how to manipulate the situation so that I was taken care of so that my needs were met. Even when I got attention negatively, I always got my parents to involve themselves with me, with my problems, with my concerns. All I knew was that I had the ability to get what I needed and I needed out. Another man whose schizophrenic mother created havoc at home reported, it was so bad at home I withdrew into myself. I daydreamed constantly about how I would make money and leave. I also turned to adults outside of my home who were sane. That's the only way I could feel hopeful. They were the ones who taught me life could be worthwhile and predictable. I found teachers or the parents of friends who were there during the really scary times, such as when I found my mother had cut her wrist and was bleeding all over the bathroom floor. Or when I would try to talk to her and all she could do was talk out loud to the voices in her head. That's when healthy adults saved me. They counseled me. They encouraged me. They were my role models. With a combination of my own daydreaming and planning, my ideas of what I would do, and the healthy, reliable adults who got me through those years, I felt that I could survive. That sense got me through my first 14 years. Shortly after I left home, I've never returned. Nothing later in my life was as difficult as that early chamber of horrors, surviving that I knew I could survive anything. Through positive relationships with adults, through artfully managing the environment so that their needs are met, children who make it through traumatic beginnings learn how to deal with trouble. They do not, perhaps because they cannot, run away from the problem. Rather, they adapt ingeniously. By doing so, they discover their capacity to cope, to solve things, if only temporarily. 
and to be superbly creative. Their discovery of personal strength is accompanied by feelings of hope and inner confidence. In adulthood, they then tap a vast reservoir of resourcefulness, energy, and creative skill because as children, they earned the right to believe in these aptitudes. By contrast, persons with low self-esteem must learn if they are to grow whole, that they have power and that they can surmount difficulty. They usually do this in two ways. The first way is by growing more aware, learning something about the dynamics of the issue by reading, attending lectures, studying, and thinking deeply on the subject. The second and perhaps the more important way is by dealing with the very things they find most difficult. At some point, they must face their own difficulties related to goals they may have long ago discarded as impossible or undesirable. They have not seen or experienced themselves as capable of going after even the small things that they've wanted. A young managerial dropout sat in my office not long ago, lost and bewildered. Her eyes were dry, no longer able to shed tears for the wasted life she believed she had led and that she considered ending. I've always been afraid, always anxious that I wouldn't be able to do what everyone wanted me to. It happens every time I want to do something like get a good job, live on my own. I always seem to screw things up just when I'm on the right track, like doing too much, overdoing things from the start. When I started college and I had to make all A's from the start, I put everything into my studies. When I received my first C grade, I was completely deflated. Then my behavior swung to the opposite and I stopped studying at all. When I knew I should be actively studying, I just watched television or ate or went out with friends. It wasn't the grades that really mattered, just like it isn't the failures now that really matter. What concerns me is that I feel so horrible all the time. You know, inside, I feel like nothing really matters. I even hate to hear myself talk about this to you. But it's all I talk about these days, how unhappy I am. I'm sick of that, and I'm sick of myself. A closer look at her life reveals she had a dominating, strangulating mother whose injunctions were, be socially acceptable, meet the right people, be something. These messages carried with them another message, you are not socially acceptable. You are not something in and of yourself. While the other two individuals quoted above had concrete, invisible problems against which to fight poverty, a mentally confused and sick parent, this woman's early life was on the surface more physically comfortable. What she needed to do was extract herself from the belief that she was somehow blemished and helpless in controlling her destiny. In order to do that, she needed to identify the grain of the person she really was deep within herself and begin to let that person out in her daily choices and actions. Because it is unlikely that parents who are themselves strangled by low self-esteem and negative self-worth can love, part of her job was to disentangle herself from her mother's voice. This turned out to be a long process requiring much therapy. But whether an individual needs or chooses to go to therapy or selects some form of self-ministering, personal power can only be gained by choosing to act on behalf of our own inclinations, potentials, and distinction. In this way, by seeing ourselves actively in our own corner, we earn the right to believe in our own power. Two, the competency issue. Each child also wants to know, am I competent? By this we mean, do we have the capability, perhaps even the brightness and the wherewithal to learn to solve practical problems to reach our own solution? Children watch to see if significant others step in to rescue them during new learnings or if they are trusted enough to learn how to do something on their own. If successful in meeting the demands of simple growing up experiences such as learning to read, playing a new game, riding a bike, dancing, getting along with bullies, and so on, they conclude they are capable people who have what it takes to perform successfully and effectively later in life. If, however, they watch themselves fail 
or if parents, teachers, siblings, and peers tell them they are failures, then they carry that message of failure with them into adulthood as well. A child may decide she is woefully incompetent if her parents rush in to do things for her time after time. When a parent's attitude is, here, let me do this for you. I'll do it quicker and better and I won't mess things up. The child learns something about her own competence or lack of it. A repeated string of such, let me do it for you, dramas, carries with it the message, you are stupid and slow. Whether a parent scowls with displeasure at the children's inability to fight his own fights or talk things over with him while he... While helping him stand up to playground bullies, the child collects data for his mental scrapbook about his competence. People who are overly dependent on the expectations and directives of authority figures, say superiors at work or doctors or lawyers, seem to have an inordinate need to be liked by those people. Often they take jobs that are too easy for their innate talents or intelligence and seem to act out of a belief that they cannot do any better. This frequently is because they do not believe they can do any better. On the other hand, those who are tough-minded, independent, and responsible believe they can master things. They demonstrate their competence in daily performances. Not only does this help their ability to progress in a way that honors their uniqueness, but it also strengthens the belief that they are competent. In other words, they increase their belief in their capabilities as they mature. Three, the likability issue. The opinion, I am a likable person, people accept me and like to have me around, is also formed in early childhood. We look for evidence that we have significance and worth in the eyes of others. We watch what they, our parents, teachers, siblings, etc., do while we are around. When we speak, do they look into our eyes and listen? Or are they preoccupied with more important things? Are we disciplined in a way that tells us that we are good persons in spite of our mistakes? And that we are capable of understanding what to do differently next time? Or are we taught that we cannot do anything right? Do others speak to us calmly and openly, communicating that we matter to them? Or do they talk to us as if we were sheep, telling us what to do exactly how, as if we hadn't minds of our own to figure things out? Do we sense we have permission to speak up for what we want, to know what we want? Or is there a silent, unspoken game being played in which we are supposed to act out of the role of stupid, pretending we don't know the answers to certain questions, pretending we don't want what we do want? All these questions, if answered honestly, help us see how we have come to our own conclusions about our likableness. These questions and our highly subjective individual answers determine our level of self-acceptance, our sense of having or not having a rightful place in the scheme of things, which relates importantly to our adult sense of having a place in the world of work, ultimately a place in the world itself. Those who feel likable and worthwhile in childhood learn that they can state their honest opinions and needs, that they can think of what their preferences are, that they will not be rejected if they ask for what they want. This is a vastly important lesson and gift for when people sense that they will be rejected if they speak up for what they want and need, they learn to swallow these requests, stuff them down into themselves. Eventually, if they are too timid or if the rebuke they get at speaking up is too severe, they forget what they want, as did the executive whose comments opened this chapter. I remember when I was a child, I learned well from my European born and bred parents how not to ask. When we visited friends, I was instructed to not ask for a drink of water, not to ask to go to the bathroom, not to accept cookies if they were offered, only to take one cookie, just sit there like a polite good girl. Readers may identify with my overdeveloped sense of politeness that evolved over time because of such instructions. My thought of my thought was that good girls didn't speak up. Fortunately, I also learned in other situations that it was all right to know what I really wanted. 
Had this other significant lesson not been learned, identifying my own vocational directions might have been more difficult. It takes some doing to speak up for what we know is right for ourselves, especially when we are youngsters living in a family of frowning others who know what is right and wrong for us. This is even more true for the child who is naturally timid or interprets things, people, and events as fearsome or unmanageable. In all fairness to parents, it must be said that children differ in their interpretation of what their parents do and say. Some children take the slightest criticism as a heavy, profound rejection. Others are more sturdy. Some are aggressive from birth. Even more before birth, they kick and pound in their away in their mother's wombs. Others are silent, quiet types. A large part of how we think about ourselves comes from the way we think our parents saw us, or more precisely, from the way we think they treated us. More than likely, it is during this sensitive period that we get our mottos, scripts, and maps for our lives and choices. We literally ingest the messages we get from our childhood, metabolizing them into words of personal strength and capacity, excuse me, capability, or weakness and ineptitude. The, then these ideas strung into repetitions reinforced by experience form the architectural framework for all of our life experiences. If early messages tells us that we are okay, then we believe I'm pretty good. I guess I'll have a pretty nice life. It looks as though I'm going to have fun. On the other hand, if the messages received tells us that we're lacking in some way, we may decide that we're not very likely to have a personal shot at true happiness. We may believe we don't deserve to reach out for the things we want. Thus, we tell ourselves to get used to being on the short end of things to adjust to dwelling in anxiety or in the drab, lusterless experiences, wondering, always wondering why suffering is so much part of our lives. Or we may believe, as did the woman who managed to leave her poverty-stricken home, that we deserve better. And so we strive for and finally attain it. The above discussion all leads to one essential point. It is from the business of childhood that our adult working life takes shape. This includes our ability to identify what it is we want to do in life, the happiness we allow ourselves to reach for, the way we solve or avoid problems, our willingness to stand apart from the crowd, our ability to take responsibility for our decisions, and our ability to be responsible for the goals we set. Persons with high self-esteem feel a connectedness to their own inner drives images and objectives at the same time they feel related to others and their values are typically life supporting indeed they enhance other people's lives as they enhance their own so that is the opening two chapters and this whole book goes into resistant and helping you identify what it is you love and addressing those needs as you can see it's kind of a little activating kind of going into the traumatic experience especially love how it goes into the pre-verbal states of being an infant and how also a lot of our traumas can also be perceived maybe mom didn't mean to give us that adopted idea of our self-value However, unconsciously, when she pulled away, we adopted and believed this idea that was never directly stated. However, it was the perception. So I kind of love all that. Feel free to rewind and re-listen to this or feel free to give yourself permission to pick up this book. Very easily accessible. And I felt like it was very, very beautiful. And I'm looking forward to finishing it. It's been definitely um, changing my perspective about my pursuits. I'm certainly guilty of growing up thinking I wasn't smart enough or that I wouldn't be able to accomplish some of the things due to that uh, lack of self-belief and different things that teachers and uh, community has said. And then through my developmental process, I've grown to believe new ideas, which is why I'm always encouraging um, 
for you to change your mindset and to practice with mindfulness and meditation to really watch these belief systems so that we can shift them into a alternate state of consciousness or a non-ordinary state where we are kind of getting out of the habitual response and entering into a new state of awareness. And so I've been offering these kinds of sessions for individuals who like to get one-on-one -on -one with me, where we get in private and we do some talking and that kind of gives me a space to listen to your internal narratives. And then I can kind of help you identify where you might be creating lack or limitation or a childhood abusive thought is re-expressing itself in your own mind and it's someone else's voice who is expressing itself through you so that way we can move through this by honestly number one is that we got to accept hey there is a voice in my head saying these things and number two i'm believing these things and i'm believing this lie and this existence that i cannot do what i love to do and then again, going through the motions of even furthering that process, which can be even more unraveling of other stories or other expressions where that same trauma was reinforced. Or you can say that we recreated new relationships that reminded us of that original injury that continue to prove, you know, like the book was saying, uh, reinforces that idea that we're clenching to about the self instead of looking for, um, disconfirming experiences and things like this. Thank you so much for, um... <laughs> I wonder who Little Rabbit is. <laughs> Were you inside my boxer group of Free to Be Me? <laughs> um, thank you so much um, for sharing your time with me. I'm going to be coming back in just a few moments to do a little video journal before closing this evening. I just wanted to say thank you. I've been very eager to share this with you for a very long time, maybe like two, three weeks. So I'm a little overdue. I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. And I'll see you in just a few.